Okay, The Hormone Fix by Dr. Anna Kabeka. In her presentation, Dr. Kabeka will show that women have significant control over how they feel during menopause. With the right nutrition, an optimized lifestyle, and simple loving actions, she has discussed also in her book, The Hormone Fix, you can dramatically alter your emotional health to minimize food, mood swings and other obstacles that impair your health and happiness. She empowers you with all the strategies she's learned after decades of working with thousands of patients to feel better. Balance your mood and create the big, beautiful, vibrant life you deserve. Her area of specialty include bioidentical hormone treatments and natural hormone balancing strategies. And she has received extensive notoriety for her virtual transformational programs, including Women's Restorative Health, Sexual CPR, and Magic Menopause. Please welcome Dr. Kabeka. Thank you, thank you. It's really awesome to be here today and, and really among so many people, some very familiar faces, some that I've known their entire lives, and as well as new friends and others that have been in my program, Denise, April, Lisa, you know, just really wonderful. Robin Nielsen was my co-host. We were combined. We worked together for years doing Sexy Younger You. Diane's worked with us. So I am among family and friends, and I'm really thrilled to be here. And additionally, uh, additionally those who I've known all their lives are here with me too. My daughter, Mira's up the front, up in the front. She's a wealth of knowledge and information, and she's here to help you as well as um, connect with you and connect me to you. So I want to make sure that happens. And my brother John in the back. So John Kabeka, he lives here in the Silicon Valley, and um, it's just you know I've known him all his life, and I have everything. <laughs> all these great stories to tell about him that he won't let me tell. So, so that's okay. I'm sure some will come up in conversation today. <laughs> but uh, I, I want to share a little bit about my story. As you know, um, you know, I, I've just re recently published my book, The Hormone Fix, and it really is my magnus opus. It really is my life's work. And it really is a journey through trauma through surviving to a life of thriving. And I believe God's put me here to help others. And, and from the work that I've done, from the studies that I've read, from the patients and colleagues and, and all of you that have worked with me through my programs, from your participation and your advocacy for your own health, that helped me write this book because I couldn't have done it without you. No great accomplishment is accomplished alone, and that is so true. And, and I wanna share many of the stories along the way in this journey. We have some time here, and I love it to be interactive and ask questions. I'll ask questions of you, so that gives you opportunity to ask questions of me. <laughs> and I may not have the answer, or I may not want to answer, but I will take your questions. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited to be here with you. And so I wanted to talk about our period of neurologic vulnerability that really, man, I wish I knew that when I trained as a physician. I wish I knew that when I was a young mother. I wish I knew that when I hit menopause at age 38 and I was lying awake at night, 3 a.m., waking up, tossing, turning, tossing, turning, covers on, covers off, leg out, leg in, right? Just can't get comfortable. Anyone experience that? Yeah, waking up, still not feeling like you've even slept. I remember that. That was 15 years ago or so at this point. So I was 38, and I was diagnosed with early premature, early menopause, premature ovarian failure, and I was told I would never be able to have another child again. And it was a time of struggle. And at that point, I was an Emory University board certified gynecologist and obstetrician in private practice in Southeast Georgia. And I didn't have the answers. So if you have struggled with your health and you've been looking for answers and you've come to me, you've come to physicians looking for answers and haven't gotten help, I want to tell you, keep asking the questions. Keep asking the questions and keep doing what you're doing here is learning and advocating for your own health and that of your family. That makes a difference. That does make a difference. So I needed to know, too, that I'm not alone in this. 
So we recently conducted a study. It was, we um, hired an organization called OneSource and they surveyed 2,000 women in the United States aged 30 to 60. And what we found out that in this age group, 47% of women experience hormonal imbalance. That's one in two of us. So we look at the 2020 census data, that's 50 million women in America. 50 million women in the menopause or postmenopause come 2020. One, you know, I mean, that's a huge number, right? So, and think of that 50 million, one and two, having hormonal imbalances, struggling, suffering, right? Now, menopause is a natural process. Suffering is optional. Menopause is mandatory. Suffering is optional. And I want to talk how we can do this without suffering. Now, I always joke, I said I'm a menopause expert because I've been through it three times now. <laughs> So like, I must, must be a slow learner, so I've got to go through it a couple times to get it right. So I'll talk about that too. What was really interesting in the, su in the study is that 72% of women had experience, didn't even realize that hormones were related to some of their symptoms. And also, the average age of the first starting of symptoms was 36. So this is the first study I know that really looked at that. So women who've had menopausal problems over 50, we surveyed them in, as a separate group and asked them, when did your symptoms begin? Age 36. Age 36, that's huge. In our gynecologic, reproductive, endocrinology book, Spiroff is our Bible, and it says, okay, average age of menopause 52, plus or minus five years. That was the last version I have. And really, what we're seeing now, 15 years. 15 years of struggling. So how many people have struggled with perimenopausal symptoms, with hormone imbalance, fatigue, weight gain, brain fog, memory issues, tired, exhausted, you know, illnesses? I mean, I've been, I've experienced, <laughs> I've experienced it all as well. So we know that these symptoms are common. And what's interesting too, and in just looking at our education, because you come to, you know, as a woman, we go to a gynecologist pretty regularly, right? And so this was disappointing to me because in this survey of women, 38% didn't know that memory loss can be a result of hormone imbalance. So we as physicians aren't sharing that information. 41% didn't know that it could, or 40, only 41% knew that it can cause brain fog. Only 38% of women knew that memory loss can be hormone imbalance. And only 30% recognize that hormone imbalance can cause urinary incontinence. That's, that's huge, that's interesting. There's a, I met one of my clients in here today using hormonal therapy changed her life and helped from vaginal dryness or dryness symptoms or discomfort, and also urinary leaking, leaking can be a big issue. So this is important information. So when I um, was invited, I'm so grateful to Dr. Susan Downs for inviting me to speak. I wanted to speak here and of course to come and visit my brother that lives here, any excuse. And, um, you know, and just the wealth of knowledge that she provides. And so in preparing to talk, I look to see, preparing this talk, I look to see other speakers and just an amazing lineup of speakers. Paul Markipola, who spoke here on autoimmunity and healing her own journey through MS, amazing. And then one of my dear friends apparently spoke last month, Dr. Filmena Trindade, and apparently she gave my speech. So I don't know <laughs> what else to say, so hence, the rest of my slides, no, I have a few more. But I wanna share, I wanna talk about this neurologic vulnerability because I wish I knew about this stage of our lives. I wish I understood what was happening in hormonal imbalance. I mean, we hear, you know, even growing up, right? You hear about midlife crises, midlife crises. Well, what if that's physiology? What if that's physiologic imbalance causing, maybe it's self-medicating behaviors? What if? I believe it is. I believe 100% it is. And if we can balance our hormones and heal our physiology, we won't have that transitional, cyclic, chaotic period in our life that doesn't have to be there that sometimes ends up in multiple prescriptions, that sometimes ends up in even surgeries, medications, addictions, sometimes ends up in divorce, relationship crises, impaired, impaired relationships and communication. So I love what Susan's done here 
today, and she's brought a community together, and, and everyone as part of Silicon Valley Health Institute, bringing this community together, because community is where we heal. And as a result of Phil Mena giving my, my lecture last month, I'm gonna talk a lot today about oxytocin, the hormone of love, bonding, and connection, a hormone that is raised in community, because we need community to heal. We hear it takes a village to raise a family. It takes a village to raise that one, I'm telling you. So it takes a village, and it takes a village to heal. And community, a little on my backstory, I'm a first generation American. My mom was an immigrant to this country, and her and two brothers out of a family of seven, family of nine, came to the United States. And so these three that came to the United States um, from a war-torn area in the Middle East, Israel and Lebanon, these three all died before their older siblings, before their other siblings, by decades, by decades. And they had the best care. Two of them had cardiac bypass surgery. Another had a colorectal surgery. All three that came to the United States died. We have everything. That made me ask, as a physician, my mom died, God bless her, when I was in residency at Emory University. She had the best of the best heart doctors. So I had to ask myself at that point, what caused her to get to this point? What was the underlying reason? I know what we did to try to fix it, but what caused her to get to this point? And why did those who came to America underlive their other siblings in war-torn, stress-filled cultures, right? So I'll share a little bit about that too because that's important. That's where community comes in and that's where authentically talking about your journey, authentically sharing and not being afraid to ask the questions. That's where that makes a difference. And also, look at what caused the problem to begin with. So for my mom, as I started digging into it, I'll tell you what caused it. Hormone imbalance, inflammation, and adrenal dysfunction. The devil's pitchfork. That'll put us in the grave before anything else. So if you've got bad habits, rely on those. No, I'm kidding. So we wanna heal from those. And um, so hormone imbalance, adrenal dysfunction, and inflammation. So whenever we get to a root cause, we're, we're coming in it from that way. And I'm really, I like to make things simple. And you'll see with my book, I keep it simple, practical. What is it, what is something I can do every day that's going to give me a healthier tomorrow? That's going to make me happier? That's going to give me better energy? That's going to give me better relationships? I want to do those things. So I'm going to break it down and leave you with three take-home points that will help you even have a healthier tomorrow so that you have more energy, more fun, and healthier relationships. Does that sound good? So I mentioned that I have a little bit of story to share with you too. And so among friends, I'll share these pictures. Not pictures I would put on my dating profile, but pictures nonetheless. This shows you where I was at age 39. I was struggling. I was fatigued. It hurt to wake up. To get out of bed in the morning, it hurt to put my feet on the floor. I had literal pain. I remember during this stage of my life, we had gone through a very traumatic accident in my family where we lost our son and he was only 18 months old. I'll share with you that at 18 months I was breastfeeding him. He was a healthy baby and, and he died in an accident. That put me and our whole family into trauma, as you can imagine, and grief and devastation. I remember mornings where I would wake up, and before I even opened my eyes, I would just start crying because I was alive. I'd had no desire to live, and I struggled. But I had my daughters that I needed to live for. And I need to show them how to handle adversity. And I also just need, knew I needed to keep the earth moving under my feet. And so literally I did that. I took them out of school and homeschooled them. Amira and her older sister and, and, and my daughter, um, Brittany, who my, became my daughter at age seven. She was in college at the time, but she joined us along the way. But we actually traveled around the world. I traveled around the world to 
grieve in, in privacy because I live on St. Simon's Island and it's a very, you know, I'm very, um, was public in my, in my profession. I needed privacy and I also knew that travel for me was my best meditation and part of my healing. And so part of that journey around the world, I met healers from all different fields, from a Native American shaman to an Andean philosopher to um, some of the, you know, most educated scientist in New Zealand, Israel, France, Germany, and an Indonesian healer from generations. And I learned different tips and, and tricks along the way. When I was diagnosed at, after I, I mentioned I was breastfeeding my son, anyone who's ever breastfed know that if you miss a feeding, your breasts are engorged. Well, from that moment, I never had another drop of breast milk. I'll intellectualize my story from here. But so never another drop of breast milk. And then after a few months, my husband and I wanted to try to have another baby. I was completely irreversibly infertile. I, feel, I failed the highest doses of injectable fertility medications. And I was diagnosed with early menopause. Despite these high injections, my ovaries never responded. And um, that was devastation upon devastation. And, you know, certainly I wasn't in the right mind. If I was, I wouldn't have homeschooled my kids. <laughs> that was a challenge. <laughs> so, so it was, you know, it was, that, it was that journey. But lo and behold, through this, through the serendipitous meetings and, and um, experiences that I had as I traveled around the world, I became pregnant. Age four, at age 41, I had the child I never, I was told I would never have. Right? I was told I would never be able to conceive another child. I reversed menopause and had another child and continued having regular cycles for another 10 years. And then menopause hit again at age 48, post-traumatic, because I didn't learn everything. I didn't learn everything I needed to know to heal not just the physical body, but the mental and emotional consequences of chronic underlying stress and post-traumatic stress. And so I had PTSD flaring under the surface at all the time, at all times. Emotionally, I was exhausted. And I was running a, a practice. A, I was divorced. We know that 70% of marriages end in divorce after losing a child. We did not want to be that statistic. We thought we were doing everything, but still, we didn't know the physiologic issue that was causing us to disconnect at that time. And I'm going to share that with you today. Because that chronic stress causes this imbalance in our hormones and our physiology that causes us into, to have more isolation, to disconnect. I call it the um, cortisol oxytocin connection disconnection. And, and so our relationship ended in divorce. But not only that, I was burning out, burning the candles at both ends, didn't know how to stop, like on that hamster wheel, continuing to go, go, go. And my hormones were out of whack again. And so I had to learn what to do to fix it. Because again, primary breadwinner for the family. And at that point, having um, daughters in high school, middle school, high school, and elementary school, you know, you got to keep a clear head. You cannot afford brain fog at this point of your life, right? They will take advantage of you for sure and manipulate you, right? And so you have to be strong. So that's when I went and I, and, and I started learning what I call my keto green way that I put into my book and was able to heal from this. I want to just show you one thing with this picture is you see the hair loss, the tremendous hair loss. We were talking about hair loss earlier today. And this is stress-related hair loss. Thyroid numbers, reverse thyroid, thyroid antibodies, all of that were optimal. This is stress-related hair loss. And this is reversible, 100% reversible. And as well, the weight, I, I was over 240 pounds and struggling at some points. And, you know, like, I don't know how much I, what my peak weight was because I stopped weighing at some point and stopped taking pictures. But so these are... These are two of those pictures, and so can reverse that. And I put what I learned in this journey, in this reversal process, in my book, The Hormone Fix, which I'm sharing with you today. And so I'm happy to share that with you and, and the techniques that, that, and disciplines that I've incorporated in my life and so many other women's lives for success. And I'll share with you too, now Ava Marie is 11 years old, and she's taking a keto green smoothie study break. 
and uh, she's the child I was told I would never have. So she's 11 and I'm 53. Hormone balance is very important, right? We want to keep it healthy. Brain, health, physical, emotional, and spiritual and relational health. That's really important. So let's talk about what's happening. And this is uh, for our hormones as women going through, and I promise I will talk about hormones with men as well. You guys, I have worked with anti-aging medicine. I've consulted with um, hormonal clinics for both men and women, and I can field all your questions in this area as well. But I want to show you here this area, which is shaded, which we consider a time of estrogen dominance and progesterone insufficiency. And so what I like to see here, which is interesting, is that you see like our progesterone start Oh, oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, do I have a pointer? I flick something, no, okay. So, um, so first our top one, you can barely see it, but in the top one is progesterone. So a progesterones are a hormone that our ovaries are, you know, we're, we're secreting in so many ways. It is a bottom line, it's a neuroprotective hormone. It protects our brain, right? We know progesterone in traumatic brain injury is therapeutic, especially the earlier the intervention. We're seeing studies on progesterone. Progesterone is a neuroprotective hormone, and it's secreted by us predominantly, I mean, throughout our life, both women, both women and men. And for men, it starts to decline in your mid-40s or so, 30s to 40s, but at a lower level. Um, you know, it's not an abrupt level for women because we ovulate and at age 35, around age 35, where our fertility is decreased. We're not producing as much progesterone when post-ovulation as we did in our 20s. So we see this rapid decline of progesterone. Estrogen fluctuates. That's the second line. We'll see that fluctuate more in our mid-40s and 50s. And then DHEA, in both men and women, that's a similar peak. For men and women, it peaks in our 20s, and then it rapidly declines from, pretty rapidly declines, too rapidly declines from there. And DHEA is another, well, we always talk about estrogen as being brain protective, bone protective, and it's you know important for fertility, femininity, et cetera. Men have estrogen too, mostly converted from testosterone. And um, DHEA is a hormone predominantly secreted by the adrenal glands in both women and men, the ovaries in women and the testes in men. And DHEA is a hormone of resilience. Healthy levels of DHEA, we can bounce back really quick. We handle stress a lot better. It's good for healthy bones, healthy brain, healthy breast. It's a fabulous hormone that our body, all these our body produces naturally. It's depleted dramatically in times of stress. PTSD, every client that I've seen and treated with PTSD, levels in the teens, definitely below 50 with DHEA. We want to see that, you know, 150 to 200 in women, 300 in men, DHEAS when we're measuring the blood. And then testosterone. Testosterone in men peaking around age 30 and then gradually declining. In women, our ovaries are producing testosterone with every ovulation. That signals our brain. Time to reproduce, you're fertile, right? If we take the birth control pills, we completely shut down that signaling, so we're less interested. But somehow, pharma <laughs> says that's a good thing because you're not gonna get acne. That's for another discussion. All right. Testosterone, important for healthy brain, healthy bones, healthy breast as well, right? Muscle building. Another hormone that I don't have drawn out on here, and again, these are, you know, this is my graph, right? Not exact representation of serum values in any specific concentration, but I wanted to illustrate this. Another hormone here that is declining as we age is oxytocin. The only hormone that goes up as we age, can anyone guess what that is? Cortisol. Cortisol, and you're right, probably insulin too. Absolutely. And so in this area between where estrogen crosses the line with progesterone and that's slightly shaded, we estimate that progesterone decreases 75% from age 35 to 40 and estrogen decreases 35% from age 35 to 50. We see this flipping or little imbalance in the ratio and we consider this a time where we expect to see these perimenopausal symptoms. That's what the research is showing. Again it's not necessary, it's not mandatory, suffering is optional, right? 
So what's happening here? And here during this age range, right, many women in our study too, age 36 starting to experience those symptoms, hormone imbalance, anxiety, depression. So we know that neurologic symptoms during this time period are on the increase for women, on the increase for women, as it was for me, PTSD, post-PTSD. So, so we have this period of neurologic vulnerability. And I hope Dr. Filmena talked about this. I wasn't able to listen to her talk. So if, um, if she's already covered it, it's awesome. Because what's really important is the state of neurologic vulnerability. Because when you come into my office complaining of anxiety and depression as a gynecologist, I'm going to give you Prozac, right? Or Zoloft or Celexa, right? Let's just, you know, Let's just handle this right now. It's cyclic PMS. Let's just wipe this out. Then you're going to come back and you're going to complain of irregular periods, even you know continued PMS, maybe heavier than usual periods. So I'm going to put you on the birth control pill. And then you're going to come back another months or years later, and you're going to continue to complain of regular irregular cycles, breakthrough bleeding. You don't like the way the Prozac or the pills make you feel. So I'm going to say, okay, well, let's just take out your uterus and let's just end this problem right now. And then, then what happens? Then you come back and you say, well, you know what? Now I have no sex drive. Not only that, I can't remember the last time we had sex. And that's not a, you know, it's not a timing issue. I've got this brain fog as well. And I'm having discomfort and, you know, I don't like how I feel. I'm continuing to have problems. So my job's done, y'all. I'm sending you to, I'm referring you out. Here's the divorce attorney that I like and a psychiatrist. <laughs> right? So what I learned through my journey and, um, and my own experience, so what I started to do when a patient came in with these symptoms early on, I, first of all, I want to get your body balanced. I want to remove toxic estrogens and toxins from your system. So I put my clients doing blood work and put my clients on a detoxification program. In my book, I have a 10-day quick start keto green detox diet, so very similar. And, and while, my, while my client's doing this 21-day detox till she comes back in for the lab results, I may or may not at that point too put some bioidentical progesterone on board because she's neurologically vulnerable, right? She's having issues, there's brain fog. We know the ovarian function's low and we can protect her from that. And, um, and, or, and nutrients like maca and detoxifiers like milk thistle, vitamin C, to help also improve hormonal detoxification. And so then the patient comes back in for her lab results in four weeks. And you know what? She's 90% better. 90% better with essentially no other intervention than lifestyle and nutrition recommendation. So I went from doing two to three surgeries pretty much every week, one to two weeks, to two to three a year, two to three a year as a gynecologist. So that blew my mind away because in medicine, we don't talk about reversing menopause. We struggle with reversing fertility issues, right? And I did both. And then... At Emory, we have a saying that says, the eyes don't see what the mind don't know. Well, now that I knew this, I saw it everywhere. I saw the effects of trauma and stress on relationships. I saw the effects of, of you know, that cortisol, oxytocin, disconnection, that burnout. A urologist colleague of mine came to me and he said, you know, I have loved my practice for the th last 30 years. Now I can't even stand to go into work. And he goes, you know, it's paperwork, it's the hospital breathing down me, it's the insurance companies trying to dictate my management. I've been doing this for 30 years. And I said, that's burnout. That's the oxytocin cortisol disconnection. And it's a shame to lose good people from a field they love and have passionate and passion in to this burnout. So if any of you have ever experienced this, where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm coming home and I'm looking at my wife and I no longer feel love for her or him, and I'm looking at my um, job that I've loved, or I'm not no, and I no longer feel enjoyment for it. If I'm experiencing depression, anxiety, we have to ask what's going on underneath. What are the issues? What's disrupting our body? What's affecting us to make us feel this way? Is it toxins? Is it stress? Is it a nutrient deficiency or malabsorption syndrome? We can start there and see what 
the reasons are, but that's a good place to start. So we have to heal this. We have to improve this period of neurologic vulnerability, vulnerability because we are medicating American women. We are medicating women and men. Anti-anxiety medications, antidepressant medications, sleep medications that really don't put us in REM sleep, restorative sleep. We're losing good men and women all the time. And that is unacceptable. We can't stand for that. And I'm glad you guys are here learning. So what's interesting here is as I looked at this period of neurologic vulnerability in my own life, and I recognized, okay, we can heal it with some hormonal therapy, but like I say, you know, it takes more than hormones to fix our hormones. We've got to work on the lifestyle factors and the nutritional factors that heal our cells at their microscopic level from cell to cell communication, just like we are communicating in our room. Our cells to have a healthy function have to communicate nicely with their neighboring cells. So we have to heal that point. When we start aging, it's important to understand that as we're experiencing brain fog, memory loss. Now, let me just step back one second and tell you that, you know, as a physician, I had an, a love, I had a great visual memory. Uh, maybe as good as my brother's, I'm not 100% sure. I would say it's better, <laughs> he'll argue. But I had a great memory. And um, I lost that completely in this transition time period. I couldn't remember. I was constantly forgetting. I was irritable, agitated. I know my daughter would never say that. I will beat her if she does. No. <laughs> uh, I was never agitated or irritable. I was agitated, irritable. We'll call it witchy, frankly, bitchy, right? So it, during that time, and I was like, what's happening with my memory? Well, we know cortisol affects our memory, but more than that, as estrogen declines, we experience more of this brain fog. Now, that's pretty intimidating, especially if you're running a company, you're you know, competing, there's millennials coming up behind you in your chosen field, and you're feeling like you're losing your edge. I heard it from so many women. And I wondered why. I knew I could help with progesterone, but why was this happening? Well, just actually in the last few years, I started reading some of the research looking at this in women. Glu we use glucose for fuel in the brain. We either use glucose or ketones for fuel in the brain. That's important to understand. Well, gluconeogenesis in the brain or utilization of glucose in the brain is an estrogen-dependent process. So that makes sense. As we're aging and estrogen's declining, we're, we need to switch to an alternative fuel source, right? This is the effects, of, this is glucose metabolism in the brain. I mean, this should be front page news. This, pub, this study was published in 2015, May 2015. And, and you can see here that, you know, um, glucose metabolism in the brain is the red line at the top. So in the perimenopause, that state, age 36, 40 to 55, we are losing progesterone, estrogen's declining, and what do we see happening? We have symptoms, the blue line, increase exponentially. Endocrine and neurological symptoms, brain fog, agitation, irritability, all associated with glucose utilization, glucose metabolism in the brain. That's pretty profound. How many people knew this? This should be front page news, right? This is powerful. Why didn't I know this? Well, when I hit menopause the second time at age 48, my ex-husband had a traumatic brain injury and I was struggling. I was struggling, like I was spiraling. Memory was an issue. I mean, I was maintaining physical health, but emotional health, relational health, all of that was struggling. All of that was suffering. And so, and, and that brain fog, right? So it was burning out from my practice, burning out from my relationships, burning out. And I also experienced what pretty much every other perimenopausal woman would experience. She'd come into my office and tell me, Dr. Anna, I'm gaining 5, 10, 20 pounds, and I'm not doing anything different. Well, in my 30s, I would say, really, you're not. Really. Surely you're, 
you're eating more, not taking the stairs, what's going on, right? But then it, when it happened to me, 5, 10, 20 pounds, I wasn't doing anything different. Brain was in a fog, and I was like, hey, man, I've been over 240 pounds. I don't want to go there. The weight's coming on, and I'm not doing anything different. What's happening? This is that shift, right? Maybe it's not just the brain that has impaired glucose metabolism or energy utilization. There's a metabolic stall going on. And that's when I started to try to do keto. So you hear about keto everywhere, and I know you've had speakers on keto. And let me tell you, whenever I tried keto for myself or put my patients on it in the perimenopause, patients didn't like it. I called it like I was going keto crazy. And you can't do that with teenagers. They talk about terrible twos, terrible teens, y'all. That is bad stuff. So you definitely can't do it with teenagers. And, um, and so I had to get clear, right? That was unacceptable. I needed to understand what's happening. So I started back to my functional medicine principles. Like, okay, let me just check, you know, because, you know, let me check my urine for its pH because this is a highly acidic way of eating, right? Asi my urine pH was acidic, acidic. So I actually brought some urine pH samples. Amir, will you just pass them out? These are my ketone pH tests. So you guys, during break, just go pee on the stick and <laughs> let me see your results. This is fun. Guys, you can go outside. Women, the restroom's around the corner. So, so you know, Acidic, acidic, acidic. So I needed to go ahead and get alkaline. And I wanted to get this weight off, so staying low carb, following, trying to think, okay, keto. But we know that in order to detox toxins healthfully, we've got to have the alkalinizers on board. We need the minerals. We need the antioxidants to help us safely remove toxins from our body, to flush them out and eliminate them safely. So I started working on this and then got my body, got alkaline, urine pH consistently alkaline, 7, 7.5, 8. And then um, I pushed my body into ketosis and worked to maintain the alkalinity with the low carbohydrate greens. So, and April's here from first class magic menopause in 2015. So, so that was, that was my finding, that this made a huge difference. Not only did the weight come off, but the clarity was there, the brain clarity, and I call it energized enlightenment. I had a higher spiritual connection. I had clarity. I experienced the peace that surpasses all understanding because nothing in my external environment had changed, right? My business was suffering. I'd retired my practice near you know, financial distress, near financial bankruptcy, to be honest. And, you know, was really struggling at that time. But then I had this peace that surpasses all understanding. And, you know, that sense like, okay, I've, I can make the right decisions. And that was just on a side note, but I love the mental clarity. And, and that's why, because let's compare using glucose in the brain to gasoline, right? We can use Glucose for fuel in the brain or ketones for fuel? So glucose is to gasoline as ketones are to jet fuel. And no matter how old we are, we will use ketones in the brain whether we have estrogen or progesterone on board or not. So for brain health, for reducing the risk of dementia, for the reducing the risk of cognitive decline, we need this. We, we need to at least periodically cycle into a state of ketosis. Now, I am here on vacation technically with my daughter and visiting my brother, and we're gluttons for sure. We love good food, good wine, and it, yeah, no, I'm not in ketosis. Can tell you that for sure. But um, periodically getting into ketosis. So I have a rule of thumb that I teach in my programs. 10% fasting, 80% keto green is what I call it now, keto alkaline or keto green, and 10% feasting. And that's really important. Now, this reminds me, though, just to briefly mention that we... Um, as women, we're always working. We, we're thinking about our family, we're worrying, and men too, right? But, you know, it is important we, to have this clarity and have this energy and have this physical and mental state of health so we can enjoy our lives. We can have energy, we can have fun, and we can have healthy relationships. The healthy relationships part is getting in the oxytocin. So in my keto green way, I don't just teach about getting into ketosis, which manages what hormone does getting into, what hormone does getting into ketosis optimize? Insulin, absolutely. So ketosis for insulin, and then the alkalinity or the green part 
because I ha I'm having you measure urinary pH, and this is important. It's not urinary, p ur our urine tells us so much, right? It tells us about, <laughs> Diane, you wanna give this part of the lecture? <laughs> Our urine pH tells us so much. I mean, it, you know, it really, it really does. Our urine can tell us so much about anything, right? If you've ever had a urine test to look for infection, to look at hormones, hormone metabolites, what's your estrogen metabolism doing? You know, we can look at your urine to look at mitochondrial function by measuring the byproducts of the Krebs cycle, right? So we can look at urine. So pH tells us, number one, nutritional status, that's important. Number two, if we're stressed and we're pumping out cortisol, guess what happens to the urinary pH? Acidic, absolutely, because cortisol is gonna affect the mineral corticoid receptors, increasing hydrogen excretion, and we're gonna get acid urine. So in my program, we test our urinary pH to make sure we're getting micronutrients on board, but also incorporating lifestyle factors to reduce stress and improve our quality of life. And that affects which hormone? That green part, alkalinity part, is managing which hormone? Cortisol. Cortisol, because we're going to work to monitor how are we doing for our stress management? Are we meditating? Those of us who have experienced trauma, who have had PTSD, and enter the stage of neuro or adverse childhood experiences and enter the state of neurologic vulnerability, we don't do as well as those who haven't. There's that constant cortisol stress going on. And that's really important to regain extra daily lifestyle principles and practices to reset our circadian circuitry. And that's really critical and that's what I teach. And then the third hormone, which is the most important hormone that I teach about, is the hormone of love and connection. Now, which hormone is that? Yes, my daughter was listening. Makes me so happy. Now, it's really also important to understand as we, as we, as we go into this, that, and then we look at the research, and especially when we talk about keto, right, that men and women are different. Kind of get that, right? We do things differently, <laughs> right? We experience things differently, right? Just a few ways that we're different. So it's important to understand that. So we'll talk about this. Yes. Can you explain the, um, the urine strips and how they can use them and how, um, like how they may if they're alkaline? Would you like to, Amira? So, um, so the strips that you have in your hand right now are my keto pH strips. The top pad um, is the ketones, and we like to see that red if you're in ketosis. And the bottom pad is alkalinity, is a pH, is a measure of pH. So, or, oh, the short, like, so the long end, if you're holding the long end, the one at the very top is measuring ketones, and the one at the bottom is measuring pH. There's a pad in between for absorption issues. We found that this improved the readings of the, of the urine test strips. So, keto pH urine test strips, keto pH urine test strips. So again, because I was testing on a regular basis and I recommend my clients as they enter magic menopause, enter my programs, to test several times throughout the day because we want to see how our body's responding to our environment and will tell us other things. Number one, are we getting enough micronutrients? Are we handling our stress well? Are we, um, maybe we have, if we're not getting alkaline and we're doing everything right, then we can investigate why because that's part of the discovery, kind of, I say, getting on your Nancy Drew and figuring out what's going on. And so is it food sensitivities? Is it inflammation? Is it a high hyperglycemia? What's keeping us from getting an alkaline urinary pH? So just a fun, very inexpensive way. We talk about tests don't guess, and I'll talk about four other tests that, at least two other tests that I think all of you should know for your, um, for your day. I mean, you should know it as you know the number on the scale. And so for a daily, just self-discovery and discernment of what's working for you and what's not working for you, and so you can get keto green or keto alkaline, simple to check your urine pH and urinary ketones. Very easy. And there's a couple other tests I want you to know, like you know the number on the scale. One is your hemoglobin A1C. How many of you know your hemoglobin A1C number? 
a few. I want all of you to know. How many of you know what your, how much you weigh? All right, okay. So you guys can measure, right? Testing. What gets measured gets managed as much as we hate to do it. But measure your hemoglobin A1C. I want to know that number. Optimal is less than 5.3. My numbers used to be 5.7, 5.6. Both my mom and dad had diabetes. And um, now my number is 4.8. We can change that. We can shift that. I, and um, on that note of diabetes, when my dad was 79 years old, back in 2005, he, four or five, he um, was really struggling. He came, he flew from Pennsylvania to St. Simons Island, Georgia, and was staying with us, and he was irritable. My dad was World War II Navy, 20 years Navy. He was a happy, jovial man. He was a diplomat for the United States and the Middle East. And, and he came to my house, and he was cranky and irritable, and I could tell he wasn't feeling well, and he was stingy. I didn't want that. And so we, um, so I asked him, I said, Dad, what's going on? And he said, you know, Anna, I just don't feel well. And I said, would you like me to call your doctors? And at that point, 2004, I was out of residency five years, six years in um, St. Simon's Island, and I'd already been studying um, functional medicine. And so let me talk to your doctors. And so I called up his heart surgeon, his heart, his cardiologist, it's not his heart surgeon. I called up his cardiologist and I said, you know, you know, my dad's not doing well. He's really struggling. And he goes, you know, Anna, your dad's 79. He's lived a good life. I said, I know, I know. Um, do you mind if I, and I, I was like, do you recommend anything? He goes, that was, that was his recommendation. Do you mind if I intervene? And while he's here, let me see what I can do. He goes, of course, go ahead. And I asked my dad, of course, want consent, even of our family members. Dad, do you mind if I, or well, first I said, Dad, are you done living? Because your cardiologist is done with you. <laughs> and he goes, no, I'd like to make 80. I said, well, that's a good attitude. I said, do you mind if it, I'm going to put you on my detox program and, and help you out here? And he said, of course. Of course. And so my dad had taken the wheelchair through the airport to come. He was cranky. He was staying in his guest room and irritable. I have to admit, I did take his beer away. Did not make him any more friendly at that moment. And I put him on my program. In 30 days, he lost 30 pounds. In 30 days, he went from 120 units of insulin a day to 20 units of insulin a day. In 30 days, he went from having to take a wheelchair to transport himself to my house to being out on the tennis court with my kids in 30 days. And then let me tell you what else. He lived another 12 good years and passed away last year, a year and a half ago at 91. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And so we're never done living. We are never too old. And if that's been seated in your head, fight back because that is unacceptable. So, and, and I've seen I've seen clients in my in my practice in their 80s, taking charge for themselves, doing my programs, learning what's their next right step. Right? We're never too old and never too young to learn. So that's important. So let me. Um, go on for a little bit of distinction between keto and keto green. <laughs> so when we think keto, we think, okay, bacon and butter, right? But we know, at least in this room, we know that we're going to be a little bit healthier than that because the research is in favor of plant-based diets, right? Every healthy culture, every blue zone has a plant-based diet, right? Have a significant amount of plant-based foods. And so this was an interesting, you know, looking in this. And, and when I was, you know, five years ago now, six years ago now, looking at keto for myself, and I was, you know, feeling horrible on it. Again, men and women are different, right? So I mean, men can do it better. They've got a lot more testosterone. Women, we have that neurologic vulnerability, especially in the perimenopause, and we've got to be really conscientious of what we're doing to nourish and detoxify our body on a regular basis so that we can achieve this hormonal balance. So I looked at some of the cultures that they base the keto, you know, the, the high, high fat keto diets on, right? And, and you know about the Inuits in Alaska, right? High fat diet, that's why they're keto. And I looked at them like, God, they've got to have alkalinizers. So I, I studied their diet. Well, guess what their alkalinizers are? Guess what their keto green aspect of their diet that they've learned they have to do to be sane and healthy is? They drink bone broth. They drink fish bone broth. They put minerals in that. I mean, that is loaded in minerals, right? Bone broth. And I was like, aha, that's how they're getting their minerals. How could they do it without it, right? And whatever else. 
But they definitely learned in order to survive sanely with good mental cognitive function that they had to get some green or alkalinizers in there somewhere. And so bone broth. So this is an example of a keto green plate that um, I have 10 day keto green detox and another 21 days of menu plans that look at, at this aspect of what we need to do to improve detoxification because our gut, more important than our genetics, right, are essentially as important, if not more, as than our genetics, these trillions of organisms, is improved with the higher the microbial diversity in our gut, the healthier we are, right? And how do we need to get it? Plant-based foods. Diverse plant-based foods. What's on that plate? Can you help us? Oh. oh, yeah. So here, just an example of a lot of bacon, right? And I don't know if that's sweet tea for, or unsweet tea, sorry, from because it's a keto. But we look at that. So a bunch of bacon in one side compared to two eggs on a bed of greens with a green salad with some cabbage and then avocado for healthy fats. And typically, you know, we look at, okay, what's the quantity of carbs? So all those leafy greens, bean sprouts, some nut and seeds in there for additional healthy protein and fat and avocado, or using MCT oil, olive oil. You know, good healthy fats is essential and that's the way we get this keto green part to help balance our diet, to improve our micro microbial diversity, to improve hormonal detoxification, to remove toxins from our system. That's why the combination. And then just test, don't guess. I've had vegetarians in my program and they had acidic urinary pH. Again, if you're chronically stressed or there's that undercurrent of a, adrenal dysfunction going on that we may, we may need to do more, right? We may need to add more. So in balancing hormones, these are our major hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, and insulin. And believe me, as a gynecologist, I always wanted to say it was all about estrogen, progesterone, and even testosterone, but it's not. These are the minor hormones. Even DHEA, melatonin are minor. Oxytocin should not be in, in that bottom one. And vitamin D is really important in pregnenolone. We know how important those are. Those are all very important. But the main guides, the main... Um, Controllers are cortisol, insulin, and oxytocin. Oxytocin is the most powerful hormone in our body. Now, we know that as estrogen declines, our body's ability to utilize oxytocin also declines. As, estrogen, as cortisol increases, oxytocin decreases. And as we get into the state of post-traumatic stress or chronic unrelenting stress, cortisol is frying out our nervous system and our paraventricular nucleus in our brain will then feed back to decrease cortisol production. So that's when we get into this dangerous stage when cortisol is low and oxytocin is low at the same time. So we experience that disconnect, that burnout. The people and things you loved, you no longer feel love for. That's a physiologic phenomenon. So we have to always work to increase oxytocin with the disciplines and practices that we can do to improve oxytocin. So what are some ways that you do on a daily basis to increase oxytocin? Love my puppies, Robin says. Absolutely. Note to self, that's one reason I got a puppy during book launch, to decrease my cortisol and increase my oxytocin. But potty-trained puppies are much better than not potty-trained puppies. Not so sure that plan worked out for me. <laughs> All right, what other? Definitely playing with a pet. Diane, what do you do for increasing oxytocin? Loving the hubby. Intimacy, orgasm, sex. Tell us details later, Diane. Not right now. All right. Amira, what do you do daily to increase oxytocin? Um, laugh with my family. Laugh with my family. Laugh at myself. Laugh at with my family. That's really important. What else? What else to increase oxytocin? Sleep. Sleep. Well, anything we do to reduce cortisol and improve cortisol can definitely help with oxytocin. Massage, massage, facial, hugs. hugs, hugs, kisses, beautiful wasting, head rubs increases oxytocin, swinging on a swing, like kids naturally love to do that, right? That increases oxytocin. What else? Meditation. Meditation, yeah, decreasing cortisol, helping oxytocin naturally increase. Be mindful, be in the moment. Be mindful, be in the moment. What else? Flowers. 
Flowers, they make you happy. Yeah. Increases oxytocin. What gives you pleasure? Yoga. Yoga, another way, reduce cortisol, increase oxytocin. Chocolate, Chocolate. I think you're right. <laughs> that, you know, I always look for the research to support my vices. Chocolate, wine, and coffee being the three. So I'm 100% with you on that one. So chocolate can do many things for us. Walking in nature. Walk, connecting to nature. Connecting to nature, connecting to God, spirit, prayer, meditation. And what else? Singing. Singing. What makes you happy? Now, it may not increase the person who's listening's oxytocin, <laughs> but as long as it increases your oxytocin, I'm going to have you sing later. Here we go. <laughs> doing what you love. And, and you know, we have a pleasure deficit syndrome. Like here I am, and I thought about it today because I'm always, you know, take time, have vacation, self-care is not selfish, right? It's selfless because then you can help pour into yourself, then you can pour out to others, right? Always do that. So I'm here on vacation. <laughs> Has anyone done that? So it's a workation, right? I'm on vacation, but I'm working all day today, right? And so we got to be really conscientious as women, that we, especially business owners. You know, we're wearing all these hats and we forget to take time down. But as long as, you know, what we do is what we love, we're increasing oxytocin, right? Gratitude and giving, charity, volunteering, helping someone else, making someone else happy increases oxytocin. And women, let me tell you, that's what your man wants to do. He wants to make you happy. So be sure you know what makes you happy and communicate that because that in my, in my help doctor, my sex drive has no pulse, is the number one secret women need to know about men. All he wants to do really honestly is please you, make you happy. So remember that because we have to enjoy ourselves and we are in pleasure deficit so we need to experience more pleasure in our life and so yes orgasm sex right so when's the last time oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, two, two days ago good i'm glad you didn't say just now i wouldn't shake your hand so all right <laughs> we're good we're good all right so so things to increase oxytocin decrease cortisol and that's really important and, um, and that's what we have to do on a continuous basis. So to build in practices into our daily life that increases oxytocin, I've had to do this as a discipline and a practice because I was shut down. And if I'm not careful, right, then I'll, I'll, I'll shut down again, I'll disconnect. So on a daily basis, I can't, you know, I can't allow that to happen. And let me tell you, right now in my life, I, have, I went from near bankruptcy, near bankruptcy to running a very successful seven-figure business. I went from relationships dissolving all around me and really struggling to having the best relationships in my life with the people I love and a feeling love for them, which I was shut off from. And that's important because we want more energy, we want more fun, and we want more love. And doing these principles, and I, I'd say incorporating the keto green way into your life, the disciplines and practices that give you joy, that make you enjoy, it's, it's more than about looking good, right? Because we know that's not all it. We were definitely looking good, looking healthy, looking radiant. We want to feel good, and we want to love well. So, so that's what we have to do. And I already gave you your homework. Test, don't guess. And... Um, and uh, here's some of my take-home messages. So it takes more than hormones to fix our hormones and get keto green. I didn't talk about intermittent fasting, but especially for women. And we know that if we have at least, there was a study published in 2016. Again, it should have been headline news. But it, it was published in JAMA Oncology in 2016, and it looked at women with breast cancer. And if they had less than 13 hours between dinner and breakfast, they had a 36% higher rate of recurrence. 36% higher rate of recurrence. That should have made headline news. Well, if they had over 13 hours, and so in my program I talk about 13 to 15 hours, reduced, significantly reduced risk of recurrence as well as morbidity and mortality. So that's important, right? Intermittent fast. Get your body into ketone burning state and, and feel, discern how that makes you feel. Higher you know, better memory, better connections, better spirit, you know, better spiritual connections. That's huge for this next third, next half of our life. And break fast with a keto green meal. So I do that as my breaking fast. Also with this intermittent fasting, eat by 7 p.m. And women break fast by 10 a.m. 
all right? And break fast keto grain. Plenty of recipes in the book, you know, good protein, low carbohydrate, right? We don't want carbs in the morning because our willpower will be decreased throughout the day as we struggle with fighting glucose swings. So we want to make sure we've got healthy fats, lots of greens, good quality protein as we break fast in the morning. For example, smoked salmon with capers, red onions on tomatoes, a perfect keto grain way to start your day. And, um, and tests don't cast. So I told you about hemoglobin A1C. That's a nu one number you need to know. Urine pH and ketones. You know, as, every time I stop testing, I somehow slip back a little bit. Testing keeps me accountable and keeps me doing the next right thing. And the other test I want you to know is your HSCRP, highly sensitive C-reactive protein. How many people know your numbers? A few of you, not all of you. All of you need to know your numbers. HSCRP, inflammatory marker. I had a patient come to my practice, um, in, you know, and she'd been to five other doctors. She came to me for an annual exam and told me how much she was struggling. And so I did an HSCRP on her and among other tests, her HSCRP level, which should be less than one. We want it less than one. It was 110, 110. I referred her to oncology. She had metastatic cancer. Where could we have intervened at any point above one, right? At any point above one, we could have prevented that cancer. 57-year-old woman, not acceptable. Manage cortisol and increase oxytocin. So we talked about um, so many things that you can do to naturally increase oxytocin. Now, I've prescribed oxytocin, too, when it's helped individuals. Maybe like for those of us that have had trauma, PTSD, we're, you know, it's a tough time in our lives. And we, we test actually to see if oxytocin will work for you. And then I can supplement with it. And I initially started doing it for sexual dysfunction. And then I started doing it as my eyes then saw, and my mind knew and my eyes then saw in clients like myself that it had post-traumatic trauma. And we want to turn that post-traumatic stress into post-traumatic growth. Just like we want to turn post-menopause syndrome into post-menopausal growth. And we want it to be spiritually and an always good, not horizontally. All right. So um, this is the way you can connect with me. DrAnna.com, like Drana.com, at Facebook. I have a Keto Green community on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all kinds of good fun stuff. And then my email, DrAnna at DrAnnaCabeca.com. So keep the visuals of keto versus keto green for your plates. Keep the lifestyle. Remember, is it an apple a day that keeps the doctor away? Robin, what is it? Must say, orgasm, let's just say an orgasm a day keeps the doctor away. So remember that. That's very important. I, I gave this lecture. I lecture to physicians quite often. I remember giving this lecture the next day in the hall that one of the doctors came up and threw me an apple. He goes, I had to go for the apple. No <laughs> orgasm. I'm like, man, better luck tonight, man. Better luck. All right. So I'll take questions. Thank you. Oh. So again, since we only have a mic here, if you have questions, if you can line up here, that'd be great. Make it simple for everybody. Thank you. How do you get that HSCRP number? Do you have to go to a doctor? Well, good news is you, there's a lot of ways you can self-order tests now. And in my book, I have a whole resources section for you, and including the blood testing. I also recommend the Keto Mojo, by the way. But um, ultalabtest.com, you can self-order tests. You need to know these numbers. Don't rely on us who are busy and the insurance company. Like, you know, I, we as physicians go into medicine to help people, right, to heal. And somehow we come out maybe feeling like we're pimps for big pharma, right, or we're under the scrutiny of the insurance companies. I mean, I was. I was telling Susan, you know, earlier that um, – that it's, you know, so don't rely on us. You don't know what we're dealing with in our medical boards and everything else. Order your own test. Ultalabtest.com, it'll cost you $20, HSCRP. I have it, if you go to ultalabtest.com forward slash Dr. Anna Kabeca, you'll see my basic panel and my elite panels looking at other hormones as well and markers. So order these tests yourself or ask your doctor HSCRP. Sometimes they want a code or a diagnosis code, which sticks on your record too and can increase your insurance premiums and all that good stuff too. Same with hemoglobin A1C. 
I mean, it should be something that your doctor's ordering regularly, but I learned in working with my infertility patients, even if I labeled them hyperglycemia, their insurance premiums went up. I even had one client's insurance drop them. So as much as you can keep for your own information, because you want to watch that number go down. I don't care, again, how old we are, what diagnosis we've been given, we can reverse it. I mean, Palmer tells her story, you know, dealing with autoimmunity, right? Reversing the chronic conditions that plague us, right? And we can do that. So, so thank you. Thank you. I want to say, first of all, I really appreciate you being here. I listened to your videos. I've read your book, or I've just gotten the book, actually. Yeah. But in the last 36 days, my life was totally transformed. 36 days ago, I had so much pain. I was on dozens of medications. My joints hurt so much, the doctors just wanted to replace them. And they were diagnosing me with fibromyalgia, so they were giving me lots of antidepressants and pain meds. I was taking six pain pills a day, Tylenol with codeine. It was horrible. And when I went back to the doctor, they said, oh, well, let's just try one more antidepressant. And I said, you know, I've been researching this. I would like to do something else. I think it has to do with my hormones, particularly my cortisol. And the doctor said, no, your inflammation tests, they don't show inflammation, so there's no way that, you know, you can do this. And anyway, I just said, well, I think some people's blood tests don't show this. And he finally agreed to give me a 30-day trial of prednisone. After one dose in one day, I finally got the head clearing all the pain went away, dozens of symptoms went away, and I had already studied everything else about nutrition and sleep and exercise, so I knew what to do, but I just couldn't do it, right? It's just been phenomenal. Now I'm in this mode of trying to find out everything I can, like you're talking about these tests, right? The doctors will not get me these tests. They keep saying, we'll go to someone else, and oh yeah, there's someone in integrative medicine at the Palo Medical Foundation, but they can't get me in before next fall. Um, it, it's, really, mm -hmm. it's really quite sad. I, I'm on Medicare, I have Plan F. I can go to any doctor who will accept Medicare, but it's really difficult to find them. And so, and so that's beautiful that you're here and you're advocating for your own health because there's so much information out there, right? And so doing your own testing and watching and following the principles, work on and see how the keto green way works mm -hmm. for you, right? Because how that intermittent fasting, how resting and allowing your body to completely digest and nourish and restore itself will make a big difference. Now on prednisone, you know, we know that this is a crutch, right? As we're working through this, this is a crutch. And as you're looking to discover what are the other things that have been causing this inflammation at the cellular level to begin with, that's really important to know. So thank you. Yeah, I'll just tell you, because I know you know Dr. Ellen Christensen. Oh, yes. So I've been reading his books every night, and I've been following his program. I've got all the protein uh, and uh, the resistant starches and the, and the flaxseed uh, fat to mix with smoothies. I'm trying to help all my other friends, my son, my, you know, and people like that. So I really feel like i have probably the first person who's been 36 days on prednisone. I've lost 12 pounds, three inches on the waist. My face actually has less moon face than it was when I started. So I know that I have to taper down on this, but I also know I can do it with the better sleep and the better diet. And I also want to help everyone else in my life. So just briefly, I saw a paper online that said cortisol can cure Parkinson's. And I was wondering if you had anything else to say on that, because my father-in-law has Parkinson's. And I would really love to see this change his life. Um, you know, with the clients with Parkinson's, that's where we do a lot of keto, right? The healthy keto green way, you know, a lot of intermittent fasting, a lot of working to get our bodies into ketosis. So it's, it's not my field of expertise, but it sounds like you're doing some beautiful work to help your family. I want to thank you for that. Keep it up. Oh, my okay. gosh, I'm give you a hug. All right. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. And that is, you know, discerning, being able to 
figure out, right? We need to discern what's going to work for us, what's going to work against us, no matter who's giving you that information, right? That's important because even as, as physicians, we think, okay, well, I think this may help, but we need to see how that works in your body and what's the sweet spot. How long can we do it and still get good results or are we over the top? Like for oxytocin, for instance, we can do that for quite a quite a while exogenous oxytocin, but we have to recognize that at some point we start losing that benefit. We start, in, you know, we start losing that benefit. Same thing with methylated B vitamins. There's a sweet spot and then we have to back off taking drug holidays, hormone holidays. It's really important to always like be in touch. In my book, I give you inventories, questionnaires. Keep checking. You want your symptom score to go down to zero, right? We don't want symptoms. So keep looking and see. And if you notice a flare up of symptoms, that's like, okay, well, what am I doing that's no longer serving me? And what's the next right step? So it's a constant process. Good thing we've got long lives right? Hi. Hi. My name's Antoinette. Hello. So I have a couple of questions. <clears throat> One is about the alkalinity of things. What do you think about alkaline water? It's the popular thing, the machines with the alkaline water. Does that have any efficacy toward getting yourself into the alkaline state? Number two, I um, stopped, I was on bioidenticals, and per the recommendation of the gynecologist, my sister had been diagnosed with uh, rare forms of cancer, all this, everybody was saying, well, you should come off of them. And I think I was really in a sweet spot and got very, very nervous and fearful and came off of them, put on a ton of weight and have been out of sorts ever since, very much so considering going back on them along with, I purchased your book and I know about the keto alkaline, um, process and everything. So I just wanted to kind of get your opinion about the thought process of bioidenticals and cancer scares mm -hmm. out there and um, the water, the alkaline water. Yeah, excellent. Great question. So first with the alkaline water, like what do I think about alkaline water? Let me tell you that I think let me just start with saying free refills is destroying America, right? <laughs> so, you know, you go to a restaurant, and you get free refills. Well, how much water should you drink with your meal? None, None right? Because it should, you should digest. Like I, I, you know, again, the research will support my vices. I think four ounces of wine is okay. Okay, I may have gone a little bit more last night. But um, you don't want to dilute your digestive enzymes. So first of all, when you're going to drink water, you don't want to do it with your meals because you take a piece of meat, you pour acid on it, and what happens? The meat dissolves. Take that same put piece of meat, pour acid and, uh, you know, a uh, glass of beer, a glass of water, you know, a big gulp, whatever on it. You've completely diluted your digestive enzymes. So the number one and number two drugs prescribed in America causing the number one reason for emergency room visits and acids and analgesics right? Antacids and analgesics. So we don't drink with our meals, no more than four ounces, right? Chew the food. Amira, how many times do we chew food per bite? <laughs> a lot, a lot. What? Till it dissolves completely in your mouth. Try at least 36, 42 times. Yeah. <laughs> when, um, when Amira was little, my gosh, like nine or 10, I was like, okay, we, I just learned this. We got to chew our food and not, you know, drink, not dilute our digestive enzymes. Makes perfect sense, right? Everyone that just visually you get it now, right? And, um, and so I, I, you know, the, she came to me two weeks later. She goes, Mom, it's really hard to chew, chew a grape 32 times. I'm like, oh, I guess she was listening. She was listening. But in, in regards to alkaline water, so when do we want to drink? We, first of all, when do we drink, right? We're going to stop 20 minutes before, and depending on what we've eaten, start one to two hours later. We want our food to be well digested. And so then in between meals, alkaline water, green tea, herbal tea, things like that is absolutely fine. I think it's, I think it's good, but we need to know, like, okay, are we diluting our digestive enzymes? I, I have an alkaline water machine at home, and so I will use it to make tea, to make coffee. Now, that's an acidic drink, right? But so first thing in the morning, I hydrate with alkaline. Well, I make a green. I'll use alkaline water with Mighty Maca and or a little bit of apple cider vinegar and or some lemon juice, right? A really good alkalinizing drink in the morning to help my body get energized and flush out toxins. So that's critical. And then regarding bioidentical hormones, I'm a hormone expert. 
I love bioidentical hormones, and I look for the research that supports my love of bioidentical hormones. I love bioidentical progesterone. That's my first and foremost. Before I even do estrogen, I'm doing progesterone, with or without a uterus. Now, there's different ways to take it, right? Transdermal versus oral. So oral is by prescription only. And the benefits are it will convert to allopregnenolone, which helps increase our GABA, which is our neurotransmitter of anti-anxiety. So to remember how GABA makes you feel, think of the rock group ABBA, think of the musical Mamma Mia. Yeah, it's good, right? It's that ah feeling. Right, so progesterone at night can help you sleep. The caveat is if you are a high cortisol converter, if you're in that stage one adrenal dysfunction and you are pushing cortisol, progesterone might convert to cortisol. So you need to pay attention. You want to make sure it's giving you a good night's sleep. Transdermals, we use a created a cream which has progesterone and pregnenolone, both neuroprotective and, um, and other organic ingredients in it to help with hormonal balance transdermally. So if you're menopausal, you want to take one to two days off per week. If you're not cycling or three to five days off per month, if you're cycling post ovulation to menses, like day 14 to 28, if we're trying to conceive or whatever the situation is. So bioidentical progesterone first and foremost, we know again, neurologic vulnerability, what's our body doing with progesterone? Where is it going? Is it going to cortisol or is it going downstream? So because from progesterone and pregnenolone, we're going to make a DHEA, we're going to make estrogen and testosterone. So the second hormone that I will prescribe is DHEA. So I use DHEA for sexual health, for, you know, so many ways, but I use transdermal for the most part versus oral. And when we're using oral in women, in men, we can use 10, 20 milligrams. In women, one to two to five milligrams orally, but I prefer transdermal. A little bit goes a long way. And, um, and DHEA will convert to estrogen and testosterone. When we are in stressed out stage, our body is going to work on cortisol production. So estrogen and testosterone are, are sacrificed, right? We're not going to get into those reproductive rebuilding hormones when our body's stressed. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. So you need the hormonal support along with the nutrients, herbs, and lifestyle strategies to give your body everything it needs to restore and repair itself. Do you like um, saliva, urine, or blood? Oh, do you like saliva, urine, or blood testing better? Yes. <laughs> it, so I would tell my clients that came into my office, I said at, at, every, at some point in your life with me as my patient, I'm going to test every single one of your body fluids. Every single one. We'll do stool tests. We'll check saliva. We'll check, chest, check blood. We'll check urine, serum. I mean, just name it. And the reason is because hormones are energetic molecules. Thank you. Okay. Hormones are energetic molecules, and we haven't begun to really be able to understand them, let alone be able to measure them consistently. And that's why you get all kinds of differing answers. When your test one minute can say one thing and another time it can say something else. I have a whole testing chapter in my book because it's really important. When I have a patient do blood work, I want to know where in their cycle, I'll actually, if they're cycling, I tell them when to do it. I want to know, you know, I want them to do it the same time of day, the same time of month, and the same conditions as much as possible as the time before. So before exercise, six hours after a hormone dose, if it was oral. I need to know those things to interpret the testing. So we have to practice medicine that makes sense, and it's really important. It's important to understand our estrogen metabolism, and I have a whole chapter in the book looking at toxins and also again what's happening what our body produces naturally as well as you know how are we getting rid of it as well as what we're getting from other sources in the environment as well okay i also have two questions um one especially when you mentioned the this is good for autoimmune issues um i have a younger daughter who has an autoimmune issue that most doctors have never even heard of so would this be something that would help her ex explore ways to uh, work on that? Yeah, absolutely. So she has autoimmune issues? Yeah. And what kind do we she know? Is. So again, like we want to empower our body to heal itself. So it's again, look, asking the questions, looking for the right answers, watching the markers, doing some basic testing so you can look yourself. Am I, is, is what I'm doing serving me or is it not? And, and that way we can really empower the body to heal. So would working with your book or your program help 
with that? Yeah. Okay, the other thing, I've heard a lot of good things about the keto diet, but I've also heard that it's not so good for people with blood sugar issues. And can you address that? So again, like I am keto green, and that works to optimize blood sugar issues. But anyone who's a type 1 diabetic, because you're going to require less insulin, you're glyc you're, you will be able, you have to be cautious. If you're a type 1 diabetic, on insulin, insulin pump, et cetera, you can risk getting hypoglycemic because we're, we're empowering, we're decreasing circulating glucose. That's the goal. So if you're a type one diabetic, we have to be careful. But you know, keto green, we've seen hemoglobin A1Cs drop. Like I told you, mine went from 5.7 to 4.8. Other clients that have been testing in magic menopause for a long time now, or in my practice, we see those numbers improve. So thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, let's thank Dr. Anna. So we'll have about a 10-minute break here.